Heavenly Father, thank you so very much just for the privilege to come and to share your word. Lord, thank you for the trust that Paul has placed in me. Lord, I pray that you will enable me to share your word in a way that is simple, easy to understand, and yet life-giving. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So, quick definition from the International School of Ministry by Dean Sherman. Spiritual warfare is learning to recognize strategies of the enemy. It is refusing to cooperate with those strategies and then resisting aggressively those strategies in Jesus' name. So just a quick recap. We talked about five. And it's my belief, I mean, there are so many strategies, but I really wanted to focus on the five that are the most common that I think most of us have dealt with, maybe some dealing with even now. So the first one is just doubt. Um, bless Thomas's heart. Jesus is alive, he's alive. Well, yeah, I don't know what you're smoking, but I, you know, I saw him die. I know the tomb that they laid him in, and if I can't physically touch him, I can't believe. The beautiful thing about doubt is that it doesn't close the door for the Lord approaching you. You, in your doubt, may think, I can't approach him, but he will meet you where you are, just like he did Thomas, just like he did. He said, Thomas, come Put your finger in the nail holes. Put your hand in my side. I love that about the Lord. I love that about the Lord. Discouragement. It makes you see your problems that are so much bigger than God. To overcome discouragement, please don't pull back. Don't stop. Press through and do the work. We've all dealt with doubt. We've all been discouraged. And many have succumbed to the schemes of the enemy and they just simply quit. They've just simply stopped. Diversion. Diversion is the technique of the enemy, the scheme of the enemy to take something that looks good, that is actually bad, to entice you to move in that direction. Examples of that would be all the various ways we can medicate when we are dealing with doubt and dealing with discouragement. During COVID, every addictive behavior has skyrocketed. It's just gone off the chart on every age level. People in their 70s and 80s, kids in their 8, 9, 10-year-old who are full-blown addicts of some kind. When we are discouraged when we're in doubt, we didn't get the promotion, maybe you got a Dear John letter from somebody that you love or an invitation to attend a funeral. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that the enemy tries to suck the joy out of us. And in those times, he wants to divert us. He wants us to leave the straight and narrow gate and turn to the left or turn to the right. And usually it's some form of medication. Pornography, masturbation, having sex with your neighbor's wife. I mean, there's all kinds of ways, all of which are demonic all of which are an evil intent to get you to look in a direction that you should never be looking at. Trust me, where your eyes are, your feet will eventually take you. Be careful what you look at. Be careful. Be discerning. So today we're going to talk about defeat. To win a victory over, to beat, to overthrow, to prevent you from being successful. The feeling of having been mastered, conquered, or bested. Anybody here ever feel like you've been defeated? Yes, and the rest of you can pray for us. <laughs> 
because trust me, your time may be just right around the corner. It makes you feel like a failure. It makes you just want to quit, just want to give up. It's like, why, why try? Why continue to beat my head against a wall that simply will not come down? An excellent example of that is Moses. Moses, as you know, was called of God from the time his mother was pregnant. Next slide, please. There we go. I don't know if that's exactly how he looked, (laughs) but that's how I remember him. Cecil B. DeMille. Boy, what an awesome movie that was, huh? Start to finish. A little extra biblical in places. But, so here's Moses. The enemy is doing everything he can to defeat him from birth. He's put in a basket, sent down the river, hoping and praying the alligators don't get him. And sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter does. Raises him as her own child. He is a prince of Egypt. And then he discovers there's just something in me. There's something about my heritage. And he slowly but surely begins to understand the truth of his birth. He goes out and he sees an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. And in anger, he kills him and he buries him in the dirt. He's looking around. Nobody's going to see it. The next day he's out. Two of his Hebrew brothers are fighting with each other. And he says, why are you fighting with each other? And they turn to him and they say, you're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Whoop. All of a sudden, defeat begins to set in. The truth is out. You see, he thought, you see, I hope you see that all five of these tie together. They kind of lead into one another periodically. He thought he was doing a good thing by defending one of his Hebrew Brothers, and in fact, what he did was sinful. He took the life of another man. And now he's going to pay the price for that. He's going to be exiled. Pharaoh would like to see him dead. The enemy wants to destroy this prophecy of a man being raised up to deliver his people and he ends up in the land of Goshen. He's there for 30 years. Can you imagine from a prince of Egypt with every possible blessing that you can have, prestige, education, I mean you name it, he had it as a prince. Now he is isolated in the desert He's herding sheep. He doesn't know what his destiny is. Have you ever been in a high place and brought low? Ever been in a position of authority and brought low? You know how he felt, at least in part. At least in part. Defeated. But things are not always as they look. Things are not always as they appear. Next slide, a couple of more examples. I always think about Peter, impetuous. Sometimes I kind of feel like him, Peter, I get ahead of myself. Or sometimes I'm not as bright as I need to be in the moment. And so here's Peter. He's been walking with Jesus now for three years. He still doesn't understand the truth of who he is. And so 
They're on a walk, and Jesus begins to say, you know, Peter, I have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. And Peter rebukes Jesus. And Jesus turns and he says, Satan, get behind me. And I can just imagine Peter turning around and looking. It's like, who is he speaking to? He is so clueless about what just happened. And as Jesus continues to talk, Peter makes these bold claims. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you. I will die with you. And he's very sincere. He's speaking from his heart. But the thing about Jesus is that he knows Peter's heart. He knows his character. And he says, Peter, the truth is before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, I will never deny you. So Jesus is arrested. And there in that scene, Peter is overcome with fear. He denies Christ three times. He's demoralized. He's defeated. He hears that rooster crow. And I can just see him wanting to crawl under a rock. Finding a quiet place where he can just get on his face and weep the bitter tears that come with defeat. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may shift you, sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail and when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. This is a very important thing here. I'm kind of backing the story up before before he denied Christ. The beautiful thing about walking with the Lord is he sees the beginning all the way to the end. There's nothing about you that escapes his careful attention. Nothing escapes his attention. And he is an intercessor. And he has spent time praying for Peter. He knows he's going to have this conflict. He's going to be speaking into Peter's life. And he says, Peter, I want you to know I've been praying for you. And I know that you're going to deny me. But I also know that you're going to return. And when you return, I want you to be sure and strengthen the brothers. I mean, that is a powerful promise. It isn't just for Peter. It's for every person sitting here. Jesus is your intercessor. He's your intercessor. Hebrews 7.25, Hebrews 9.24, Romans 8.34. Who is he who condemns? Well, we know who is the condemner. We know who the accuser is. But it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Us. Go ahead, take your hand. Remember last week. Take your hand. Put it up. I want to see it. Put it here. Say us. Yes, us. He's praying for us. Jesus, the risen Christ, takes the time to intercede for you individually. Is he not worthy of our praise? He knows. He knows when you're going to falter. He doesn't disown you. He doesn't walk away from you. He prays for you because he knows somehow, some way, you're going to make your way back because his prayers are always answered. I wish mine were. I. I'm dealing with a little bit of discouragement from time to time. Peter's faith temporarily faltered. He repented and he returned as Jesus said that he would. And with renewed faith and courage, Peter did strengthen his brothers. And then let's look at the apostles. The crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, these guys, I swear, if, if you saw their profile on Indeed, you would not ask for an interview. You would not ask for an interview. They've been with Jesus for three years. They still believe. As they are sitting down to celebrate Passover, they still believe 
that he is going to bring in his kingdom, he's going to bring down the Roman government, and they're arguing about who is going to be in power with Jesus. Who's going to sit on the left? Who's going to sit on the right? These guys are so incredibly clueless. And Jesus loves them. And he disrobed, he takes, out of, takes off his outer garments, and it's like it's time for a lesson. He washes their feet to include the feet of G- Judas. Imagine that, holding the feet of the one who will betray you with an act of affection, washing his feet with all humility, even as he did John Beloved. And he says, guys, what you have seen, I want you to do. You want to be great in the kingdom? Learn to be a servant. You want to be really great? Learn to be the best servant ever. He's still trying to teach them the truth, trying to prepare them. He said, hard times are going to come and I've been praying for you because I have to go away. And they're still so incredibly clueless. Jesus goes to the garden The plan unfolds. You're so familiar with the story. Jesus is taken under guard. The apostles, the followers of Christ, they're watching this horrific scene as he is hung on a cross, as he suffers and dies. And what did they do? What did they do? In defeat, they ran away and they hid. What we had hoped for, what we had planned for, what we have sacrificed for, for three years, it's all gone. He's dead. And if they find out that we are followers, they will probably chase us down as well. Defeated. I just want you to think about it. Think about the time you were defeated. Think about the time that you had high hopes. You had great plans. Maybe it was the first stock market crash and you lost half of your retirement. During the depression, my grandfather lost everything. He lost his job. He lost his home, he lost his property, he lost everything. I have been terminated, I want to say unjustly, twice. Fired twice as a lead pastor. And here I am speaking to you. (laughs) If you had known that previously, you may not have asked. I know what it is to be betrayed. I know what it is to do your best to seek the face of the Lord, to walk with integrity, and to deal with the carnal, soulish attitudes of others who, for whatever reason, think you're a threat and you need to be eliminated. It's really important that we understand Romans 8.28. It's really, this is a critical, critical scripture. And sometimes it's given out kind of flippantly. And we know that for those who love the Lord, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I have to tell you, when I was going through that first termination, I didn't see anything good about it. When I came home from work after being married for four years and My wife at the time said, I don't love you. I'm in an affair with another man and I want you to leave. I didn't see anything good about that. 
But hindsight being what it is, this verse is absolutely, absolutely true. It may take decades for the truth of this verse to be worked in your life to where you see the final outcome. So let's take a look at Moses. What was it? What was it that was good? I mean, he goes from a prince of Egypt to a lowly shepherd. He learned humility because when he was in Egypt, he was pretty proud, pretty arrogant. I can just kind of take things into my own hands and make it happen. He learned humility. In the wilderness, he had a supernatural encounter with God at a burning bush. And in humility, he said to God, I can't speak. He came up with all kinds of reasons. His self-esteem didn't exist. And God kept making preparation for him and additional preparation for him so that with renewed faith that he could actually embrace the call of God upon his life and fulfill a prophetic promise. The disciples, their faith in Jesus was renewed once he resurrected. (laughs) He resurrected as he had promised. But they weren't ready for ministry quite yet. Jesus had been teaching them. He had taught them. It's like, you know, I have to go away, but I won't leave you as orphans. My father will send the paraclete. He will send the Holy Spirit. He will be for you what I have been for three years. Go and wait. And so the celebration of Pentecost was taking place and they're in an upper room. And there's this sound, like a roaring mighty wind and tongues of fire came and rested upon the heads of all 120 that were gathered. To include Peter... And now they're emboldened. They are empowered. They are seemingly impervious to the schemes of the enemy. Peter encountered the risen Christ. Peter, do you love me? Oh yes, Lord, you know that I do. Peter, Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Uh, Yes, Lord, I, I do. I want you to care for my lambs. Peter, do you love me? I can just imagine what he's feeling. It's like I denied you three times. You're asking me three times. And he didn't. He said, God, you just know. You know my heart. You know the truth. He said, go ahead and feed my sheep. He was commissioned. And he actually led the apostolic team in establishing a new order, a new church. Do all things work together for good? To those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And you may be saying, George, you don't know my circumstance. I hate that scripture because I haven't seen it come to fruition in my life. Be patient, my dear brother. Be patient, because God is no liar. There is nothing that the enemy can do to you that God can't transform. What the enemy has meant for evil, God will turn for good. Do you remember the story of Joseph? Man, you talk about a guy who went from one defeat to the next defeat, one delay to the next delay. And every delay, every defeat took him closer and closer to the ultimate goal, the ultimate call upon his life. Everything worked for good. It all worked for good. He would never have ended up in Pharaoh's court had he not been sold as a slave by his brothers. He would never have given Pharaoh a prophetic word had he not been imprisoned falsely. All things do work for good. You have to be just a tad patient. 
Moses was in the wilderness for 30 years, wondering if that verse was ever going to come true. I mean, there are so many people, so many people, for those of you that are struggling with doubt, struggling with delay, struggling with the schemes of the enemy, wondering if you have been forgotten. I'm telling you here now, he knows your name. He sees you. You are his beloved. You are his beloved. Delay, the act of postponing, hindering, causing something to occur more slowly than normal, usually more slowly than I like for sure. Delay can produce impatience and pressure causing us to respond in fear. The temptation to act in haste, to take matters into our own hands. I can't think of a better example than Saul. Called of God, king, and he is about to face a very strong enemy. But he needs to wait for the prophet of God who will sacrifice and bring the blessing of the Lord and the surety of his victory. But you know, it's been seven days. Where is this guy? You know, the people are beginning to murmur because we're seeing the enemy is gaining in strength. And now some of them are beginning to wonder, you know, maybe I should leave about now? And so Samuel is delayed and Saul becomes anxious. It says here, he waited for seven days, the time appointed for Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from, from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offerings as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, here's the thing. When I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, New Living Translation, I felt overwhelmingly compelled to take things into my own hands, and I offered a burnt offering. Ever been there? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. It's like God has given me a promise I'm gonna be the father of a nation. I'm getting older, my wife is getting older. I'm waiting. The angel of the Lord comes to encourage me. You're going, this is gonna happen and my wife is laughing hysterically. And we're getting older and pretty soon my wife says, you know, there's this custom in the land where if I can't have children, why? You can sleep with my handmaiden. She can bear you a child and it will be your child. When delay comes as a scheme of the enemy, we are tempted to take matters into our own hands, to find a shortcut, to find a way, to make it happen. We are living today with the consequence of Abraham and Sarah's decision. We are still living with that consequence generations later. Saul lost the kingdom and it went to David. Delay is a very dangerous thing. It is a scheme of the enemy. I have prayed for, I have to stop and think, 53 years. The same prayer. I don't even know how many hundreds of times. God, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a discerning heart. Because I don't want to fall into the schemes. I don't want to be snared. I don't want to set something in motion that is going to create a ripple that's going to go out for generations. 
How about you? Another temptation in dealing with delay is procrastination. To become idle, to become neglectful, to just put things off. An amazing story about ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. They were all virgins. Some prudent, some not so prudent. And they're waiting for the bridegroom as you and I are waiting. When I accepted the Lord back in 1969, there was all kinds of teaching about end times and all kinds of false prophecies about when Jesus was going to come. And I remember going to the Denver Public Library, which is humongous. And I read everything I could based on end time prophecies just in the book of Revelation. Earthquakes, famines, pestilence. And I'm reading non-Christian scientists. And the most time they gave us in 1969 and 1970 was 20 years. Those were the, the scientists of the day saying, everything is decaying so much in 20 years, we won't even be here anymore. Well, 20 years has come and gone twice. <laughs> and they're still giving out dates of when Jesus is going to come. And here's what I have observed in walking with the Lord for those years. How many virgins have run out of oil? How many virgins whose lamps have gone out? Jesus is going to return, he says, as a thief in the night. It, you're not going to get a text message or an email. Hello, I'll be there in 30 minutes. Are you ready? He is going to come, and when he comes, you need to be prepared. But you see, the enemy will use delay to cause you to just, well, you know... There's so much life to live. There's so much that I need to do, so much that I want to do. And I mean, if I don't have time for my daily devotions, ah, there's always tomorrow. Delay causes us to become idle, causes us to neglect. I see this in marriage all the time. When we do not pay attention to the little things, major things, catastrophic things occur. When we pay attention to the little things, the greatest blessings that we could ever achieve come. So here's a homework assignment that I give to every couple I counsel. I want you to stand up, hold each other, pray a prayer of blessing over each other, seal it with a kiss, and then go to work. Take 60 seconds if you're really long-winded. I have to remind the men, you need to pray out loud in a voice your wife can hear. <laughs> it's amazing how many men don't get that. And I have them stand up in my office. I said, go ahead, stand up. And they're just looking at me. No, no, you need to be up on your feet. Go ahead. Put your arms around each other. Okay, sir, you're the head of your home. You start, pray a prayer of blessing over your wife. She will pray a prayer of blessing over you. I promise I'll close my eyes, seal it with a kiss. It's kind of pathetic. I always tell them you guys need practice. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? That one 60-second exercise incorporates physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, love languages, all wrapped up in Jesus, and it builds intimacy. And when I meet with them, did you do together prayer. Well, we, we did it two or three times. Excuse me, there are seven days in a week. I want your goal to be a minimum of five. Pay attention to the little things. You reap what you sow. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, reap bountifully. But delay has an impact on us. Well, there's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. Well, what if tomorrow never comes and you're simply found wanting? At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were wise and five were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take oil with them. They weren't paying attention to the detail. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps and the bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. All of them did, the wise and the foolish. Delay has a way of doing that. We get sleepy. At midnight, the cry ran out, here's the bridegroom, come to meet him. Then all the virgins, they woke up and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us of your oil, our lamps are gone out. No, no, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go out to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived, the virgins who were ready to meet with him to the wedding, went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, here's the key sentence, verse 13. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day and you do not know the hour. Do not allow delay to rob you of oil. Do not allow the Lord's delay to cause you to become lackadaisical, to become sleepy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled Not everybody will be filled. Not everyone will drink from the well of living water. Not everyone will be called to the banquet, but those who are hungry and thirsty, they will. How's your appetite? How's your appetite? I want you to remember that God is always bowing down to lift you up. And the devil is always rising up with the desire to push you down. So how do we win? We have the victory over the schemes of the enemy when we first of all recognize his strategies. This is why I pray, God, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a discerning heart. I don't want to be caught unaware. I don't want to be caught unaware. We are not ignorant of his devices. There is not an ignorant person in this auditorium today. Say amen. Amen. There's not an ignorant person here. But how many times have we been caught unaware because we were just kind of sleepy? Pay attention. We have the victory over the schemes of the enemy when we refuse to cooperate with those strategies. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. We can't go into the world but naked and expect to defeat the enemy. Hello. (laughs) We We have to go to war prepared. And we are in a warfare. The prize is your soul. We have the victory over the schemes of the enemy when we stay in community. When we stay in community. I co-authored a small booklet with uh, another pastor because we were concerned about how many uh, men and women in ministry were falling into sin. How many were falling into discouragement and just simply leaving ministry. I want you to know it's in the thousands. It's not just one or two. And as we prayed about it, as we kind of looked at the stats, we really came to the conclusion that the major culprit was solitude. They really were not in community. I mean, you can be the head of a church, whether it's 150 or 1,500 or more, you can be surrounded by people and be the loneliest person there because you're not in legitimate community. And when you are trying to serve God by yourself, 
please understand, you are a target extraordinaire. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. If you know about anything about how animals hunt, they're looking for the one that they can cut out of the herd. They're looking for the one that they can isolate from the herd. If you are here this morning and you are not in legitimate community with brothers and sisters in Christ, please give your careful attention and fix that. I meet with four guys every Friday morning at six o'clock. Been doing it for years. Meet with another man every Wednesday morning at 7.15 for an hour. And we do life together. We do not have secrets at all. We share our success. We share our burdens. We pray for one another. We lift one another up. When one of the men was suicidal, we didn't ask him to leave. We gathered around him stronger still and we held him up. He's not suicidal anymore. When one of the guys ended up having an affair, we didn't ask him to leave the group. We walked with him for years, helping him to repair his soul and to repair his marriage. They're still married today, happily. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, very familiar scripture. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Who do you call when you are being pressed and you're battling with the schemes of the enemy? Who do you call? Who is it that walks with you? sometimes even through the valley of the shadow of death. Who is that person that you trust who understands the importance of confidentiality and doesn't feel like they have to fix you? If you don't have that person, please make it a matter of prayer and priority. Find that person. If we are going to win the victory over the schemes of the enemy, we have to aggressively resist the enemy's strategies in Jesus' name and authority, in his name and his authority. I don't have any authority. My name is George. If you cut me, I bleed red. I was surprised. I thought the first time it would be blue, but I found out I was just normal. (laughs) I was not a blue blood. All right. I'll never make it as a comedian, I get it. (laughs) His name, his authority. Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. This is very important scripture in spiritual warfare. Three things, three things are taking place in that scripture. The acknowledgement of spiritual warfare. There's a very real enemy. Your destruction is his goal. There's a two-part process of you being able to defeat him. Number one, you have to be in a legitimate relationship with a living Christ. And number two, you have to use your words. It's not mind over matter. You speak life or you speak death to your own soul. The Apostle Paul used four words, put off, put on. He has a put off list. He has a put on list that's twice as long as the put off list, if you ever take the time to research that. So when I am tempted, when I am tempted, in the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I reject that temptation to lust after Mary. I name it. I name it. I put that thought off. I reject, I reject that thought. 
and I put on. I thank you, Lord, that you have called me to be holy as you are holy. I thank you that I can do everything you've called me to do because you enable me by your spirit to do those things. If you didn't hear your words, I guarantee you nothing happened. Your words are powerful. And you have got to learn to use them appropriately so that you can win over the schemes of the enemy. And then lastly, lastly, Jude 1, 20 and 21 is a very critical scripture to me, I hope to you. But you, dear friends, must build yourselves up in your holy faith Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. I pray in the Spirit every day, multiple times throughout the day, all day. And I'll tell you why. Because when I look into the mirror... I see a man who is pitifully weak in and of himself. I recognize that and it doesn't scare me because as I submit my weakness to him, I receive his empowerment so that I can, as Paul said, do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so when I pray in the spirit according to the word of God, which I actually believe to be true, I'm actually building myself up. And I need to be built up every day, throughout the day, so that I can stand firm against the schemes of the enemy. How about you? How about you? So Pastor Paul's gonna come, he's gonna close our time together. My hope and my prayer is that this series has given you a more accurate knowledge, a more practical application of what is it that I'm dealing with in regard to the schemes of the enemy? How is it that I can walk in greater victory? How is it that I can allow God to work in me so that he can also work through me so that his kingdom is expanded and strengthened? Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul.